Well, good morning. Today I want to welcome those who are watching by streaming internet because I just had a little hunch Rule might be in that group. So hi Rule if you're there in the Congo somewhere and John Williams too. Um, I greet you on behalf of Rule. I'm standing in his um, place this morning. As you know, he's on a mission trip in the Congo and uh, he asked me to preach this sermon and I said, good, I'd be glad to preach. I always love to get back to nice. Well, what's the sermon? Gouge out your right eye. I said, "Uh uh-uh, I'm going to the Congo, you stay home and preach that sermon. I don't want that sermon. But anyway, they're over there and I don't know if all of you have been able to read his blogs, but I did want to share his last blog, which uh, had a final paragraph that really touched my heart uh, as I sat at my computer and cried. He shared that a a district superintendent in that area and that conference had come to see him and asked permission to speak with him. So he sat down to talk with this gentleman. He was, his name was Pastor Malele Kaya Shingo. And he was of one of the four districts in the North Katanga Conference, which incidentally is the largest conference numerically in global United Methodism. So this district superintendent had come to see Rural and he sat down with him and he said, you gave an offering that blessed me. And evidently in our Advent offering that we took up last Christmas, a report had come to us when we were dispersing the Congo offering out that there was a district superintendent somewhere over there and he was going from home to home living with, living with different people with his whole family. And he eventually lost a place to live and he was homeless. So part of our offering was to build a parsonage to purchase land and build a parsonage for this superintendent and his family to live in, $2,500, another $2,500 built a church near that location. And this pastor had come to rule to thank our church for that gift of $5,000 and he said the parsonage was about this high, it had gotten that far up. But here's the glitch, that pastor had ridden. 200 miles on his bicycle to get there. And I'm telling you, Rule didn't say this in his blog, but I know because I've seen pictures, they're not nice roads like we have out there. They're dirt roads and paths with uh, trenches and mud and dust and, and a mess. Three days that man traveled. Rule said, I have no clue where he ate or slept to give thanks for the offering that y'all shared last Christmas at Advent. So y'all got to know why Rural loves to go to the Congo. You just got to know. They're just so gracious and they're so thankful for everything that we are able to do and share with them. Well, anyway, so I wanted to dive into the message this morning, uh, gouging out your right eye. Yes, sir. I think if we put that on our sign out there, we wouldn't have a lot of visitors to step in today. But thank you for coming anyway. Um, one of the parishioners at St. Mark asked me this last week if she should read the Sermon on the Mount. I thought that was kind of an odd question, and I thought, why, why, why would anyone not read it? And she said, because I take things very literally, and someone had told her that she shouldn't read the Sermon on the Mount, because you can't take it, all of it literally. And she said, Lisa, do you agree with that advice not to read it? I, I gave her a very complicated answer, no. Everyone should read the Sermon on the Mount. It's the greatest message preached by the greatest preacher ever in human history, Jesus Christ. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Get down there and read it. In fact, read the Sermon on the Mount every day this week. Those three verses, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Jesus says some radical things in that sermon that he preached sitting on a mountain to thousands of people in his day. But the words he preached that we're going to look at this morning are very difficult and very harsh words. He uses some literary devices, Jesus does, in in some of these passages. You remember literary devices from high school, things like symbolism and allegory, parables. My favorite, onomatopoeia. Say that with me, onomatopoeia. Isn't isn't that a beautiful word? It's a literary device, so you have to look it up when you go home. But the favorite literary, my husband says this is my favorite literary device hyperbole. Hyperbole is exaggeration, but it's exaggeration used to make a very strong point for some reason. And Jesus uses hyperbole in this scripture that we're going to look at today. So we're going to look at together Matthew 5 beginning with verse 27. 
which reads, if you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery, you have heard that it said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I mean, you read this and you th say, oh my gosh, what, what hope is there for any of us? And then Jesus goes on and he says, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your whole body for them, for your whole body to go into hell. So it's interesting that I think if we were taking Jesus literally in the scripture, then we would all be walking around with one of these on our eyes right now. And you know, obviously I'm the only one here that has one and, and I'm taking it right off because I know it's messing my hair up and that's really important. So anyway, gouge out your eye. No one in Christendom has taken this scripture literally. Literally, because we'd all be walking out around without an eye and we'd all be walking around without an arm. So we've got to ask ourselves the question for this scripture. What does Jesus mean? Why did he say such harsh words? These are some of the harshest words spoken in all of contemporary literature in Jesus' day. There's nothing more violent or harsh than this. If you go back and read all the verbiage that was written in that era, what does he want us to do? What's he trying to communicate to us? And how should we respond? So the first thing I would say, the important point, the core idea, is that anything that leads to sin in our life is to ruthlessly be rooted out. If it leads to sin, get rid of it. And Jesus is saying, this is important. It's really important. In fact, if you notice in that scripture, twice he repeats the exact same sentence, which is, it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. So this matter of sin is really important. We've got to take it very seriously. Now, if you look at the word sin or stumble that's found in this verse, the Greek word for that is scandalon. And that's used as the bait stick in a trap. We've got a little slide up here that shows you the picture of a trap of a little boy trying to catch a bird. How many of y'all did this sometime when you were children? I think we almost all of us made a little trap like that. And he's holding his rope and when that little creature goes into that box, he's going to pull that little stick out and trap that bird. And so that is the idea, that stick is the idea used for sin. It's easy to stumble into a trap. It's easy to fall into sin for all of us. And he wants us to take this very seriously. Now, this is the trap that we have at our home. I know some of you don't know that my husband rule is the great white hunter. And this is the tool he uses to hunt with. We had raccoons and squirrels invade our house. And no matter how many repairs on the roof we did, we could not get them and keep them out. So the trap arrived and Rule caught about 28 squirrels. He caught 15 raccoons. Some of those actually we had to um, saw out of the wall, the babies that were born in the living room, in the bedroom and the bathroom. We caught an armadillo and quite by accident, we caught three neighborhood cats. I don't know about all the creatures, but I do know those cats learned a lesson. Particularly the cat that I found one morning when I went out to get the newspaper. The, the cage was on the front sidewalk. The cat was in the cage and the sprinkler system was on. <laughs> that poor little guy. You know what? He never found his way back into the trap again. We let him go home, but those cats learned. And I thought to myself, if we Christians took this issue as seriously as that cat did, to get out of sin and to avoid sin with every part of our being, it would really do us well. We all have sinned, the scripture teaches that. We've all struggled with different issues and different things. And there's forgiveness for all of our sin through Jesus Christ. But I think sometimes we take our sin a little too lightly. The sin in our lives is what 
Jesus died for on the cross. It's what killed him on the cross. And we need to be so serious to look at our sin as what it really is. It's harmful, it's evil, it breaks Jesus' heart, and in some cases, it sends people to hell. Now, we don't talk a lot about hell in this church, but it is a reality, it is a real place, and there are people who go there and Jesus wants those of us who are his family, his children, to make sure we don't get caught in that trap, to make sure we don't go to that place, to make sure we do not stumble. Now, I'm still recovering from this broken arm. I stumbled in my kitchen several weeks ago, took a dive into the tile floor, broke my arm, still doing physical therapy. I'm almost home, I believe. But you know what was really interesting as I got thinking about that, because I got up off the floor and I laid down on my bed uh, while Rule came home to take me to the emergency room. It was interesting, I wasn't there long, but when I got up to walk out the door and get in the car, the whole pile of mess on the kitchen floor that I had fallen on, we had a project going on in the kitchen and workmen in the kitchen, the whole mess had been cleaned up like that. It was gone. And you know, they're really happy that I didn't sue them. I wouldn't do that, but they were really happy. That mess got cleaned up because they didn't want anything like that happening again with anybody in the house. And I got to thinking, you know, if every time we stumbled or if there is a threat of stumbling, we made sure that got cleaned up and out of the way. In fact, ever since I fell and broke my arm, I have lived my life a little differently. I am protecting myself more now from stumbling than I used to. I don't walk through my house in the pitch dark anymore. I turn lights on because I don't want to stumble and fall. There's a number of things I do. If something's in the way in a, in a line of, you know, travel, I move that thing rather than hop over it like I used to. I don't want to take the risk of stumbling. And in our spiritual lives, we don't want, we don't need to take the risk of sinning. So how do we go about doing that? Practically speaking. Practically speaking, remove the debris that causes you to stumble. Look at your life. What things are there on the floor of your kitchen that you could potentially fall over? What things trip you up? I think we all have our own little Achilles heel, that thing that we're particularly sensitive to, that we're particularly prone to falling over or sinning over. We need to take those things and remove them from our lives. We need to put accountability into our lives so that we protect ourselves from sin. Um, my, there's a, so first thing I think, if there's a habit that can be used to lure you in, into sin, get rid of it, avoid it. Really ask yourself the hard questions. What are the habits that might be most enticing to me? Now, I'm very thankful that as a young teenager, my father took me aside and said this to me, Lisa, Alcoholism causes a lot of problems in a lot of families. It injures innocent people. It kills harmless people. It breaks families up. It causes people all kind of grievances, sadness, and brokenness in their lives. And my mother, said my father, was an alcoholic. And he said, I don't want any of my children to go there. And he said, I'm going to ask you to make a commitment with your life. I'm going to ask you, Lisa, never to take your first drink. He said, that's the only way I can know, I as your father can know for sure that you will never become an alcoholic, that you will never get trapped in that particular sin. I'm so glad my father challenged me with that because I took that challenge up and I have never taken my first drink of any kind of beer or alcohol and I have never struggled with that particular sin. And so I say to you students, we've got a, a good number here this morning, and even adults, if you are ever tempted to take a drink, just, just don't do the first one and you won't have to worry about getting in that trap. But that's just one of many, many, many sins that can trap a person up. What about the sin of pornography, which is so prevalent in our world? You know, and, and it's everywhere. And we've got our iPhones and our computers and it's just, you know, it's in magazines. It's, it's, it's just overwhelming. If you struggle with that, and many, many men and women struggle with that, you've got to put up several lines of barriers to protect yourself from falling into that sin. Because I'm telling you, what the scripture teaches is that we can lose our salvation. We can lose our lives to this kind of sin. 
Yes, God forgives us of sin. But sometimes we get so enmeshed in our sin and we get so far away from him and we actually even begin rejecting him. There are some people who never come back. So I say to you, the words of Jesus is, it's not worth it. Take up this challenge to take sin in this world and potential sin in your life very, very seriously. He's our father and he doesn't want to lose us over an issue or matter of sin. I know we could list all the many, many, many sins that we get involved with potentially every day. Those are just two of them. So eradicate any habit from your life that potentially can be that harmful to you. Secondly, if there's a friendship that causes you to sin, get rid of the friendship. I know that sounds harsh. And I generally believe that Christians do not have enough Christ, non-Christian friends. Most of us Christians have a nice little circle of other Christian friends. And we love to hang out in our little Christian clubs with all our little believer friends. And I think that's good. But if we don't have friends who are non-believers, if we don't have friends out in the, the world who don't know Jesus yet, well, we may be the only chance they have to find Jesus. So I am really big on befriending people who need to know him. So I say all that to say, however, if your friend is influencing you more than you are influencing him or her, get rid of that friendship. Or at least gang up on them with a group of believers who can help influence that person together. Be bold, be ruthless in eradicating things from your life that can cause you to get in this trap. And the third thing is to guard your mind. All sin starts in the thought life. Jesus says we're committing adultery when we even look at someone lustfully. Oh my goodness, those are hard words. So what are we going to do? We've got to guard our mind. And 2 Corinthians 10.5 says to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Jesus Christ. Well, there are a number of ways that you can do this. Take care of your mind, be more in the word of God, to be more and focused on this. You know, really only one thought can control your mind at one time. And if you're putting these thoughts into your mind, then that will help you. Involve yourself in serving others, in giving to others. Take, take you off the throne of your life and put Jesus on that throne and then give and pour yourself out to the world and to others. In ministry, in service, in love, in generosity. It makes my heart so glad that, to know we have blessed a family so significantly in the Congo with as little as $2,500. We've built them a house. It means a lot to know that the Spirit of God is moving boldly in the Congo and we are having something to do with that. People are coming to Christ in droves. There's a movement of the Holy Spirit there. The second to nothing I don't, I think we've ever experienced in Christendom, possibly. So, so it's exciting for us to be a part of that and by our generosity we can be more focused on that and more focused on other ministries and local ministries as well. But it's all about controlling our thought life. Most sins begin with a mere glance, and then that glance turns into a double take, which turns into a longing look, which turns into a gaze, and then eventually an obsession, and finally, full-blown sin. So I want to suggest to you today to gaze only at Jesus and glance at the world. Put your eyes on him. Have him be the obsession of your life. Let him be what controls your thoughts and your heart, your actions and your words. Yeah, the world is to be contended with. It's a hard challenge living in this world, but you can glance. Just glance at that and keep your focus, keep your gaze up here. When I was a, a little girl, I slept in a bedroom with three of my four brothers and having seniority in the family, I had the privilege of sleeping on the top bunk. I'm telling you, at my house, that was something we fought over and I always won because I was one of the older kids. I love sleeping on the top bunk, but the problem with that is I fell out three times and hit my head on the hardwood floor and yes, that's why I, the way I am. All three times I had a concussion, all three times I had to lay quietly on the couch and miss a week of school and be silent. And that was, you can imagine, that was hard for me. 
One night my mom was tucking me in after the third episode and I said to her, Mom, why do I keep falling out of this bed? And she said to me these simple words which changed my life. Lisa, you stay too close to the place where you first crawl in. Well, how about that? <laughs> she said, get over there and sleep against the wall and just hug that wall. And I thought, I can do that. Do you know I never fell out of the bed again? But here's what's more. The Lord used that example to teach me an important lesson. When we first crawl into our salvation, into our relationship with Jesus, way too many of us stay right where we first got in. And he wants us to move deeper and further into the kingdom of God and get away from that place where we first came in. He wants us to move deeper into the word of God, deeper into loving him, deeper into serving him. You get to the point where a tithe seems wimpy. You want to give more. You want to, you want him to be more in your world and your life. And yet so many Christians, you know, we get this little line where we find salvation, we meet Jesus, we leave a life of sin and we get over there. And, and our heart is this, our heart is how, how, how close can I live or stay right here and, and still be a Christian? I'm good, right? I'm good. At, could I move over another centimeter maybe and, and still be a Christian? That's not the spirit of Jesus. That's not the spirit of the scripture. The Spirit is to get fa as far away from that place, that place where we were entrapped, that place where sin was eating up our lives, that place where we were overwhelmed. And you know, I'm saying to you, I'm, I realize that's not always an easy thing. I realize that we need accountability and celebrate recovery, and some of us need counseling to get out of that. We need accountability in our lives. We certainly need the forgiveness that Jesus freely offers us anytime, anytime, hear me, anytime we confess our sins. He is faithful and just and forgives us our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That's available to us, but our heart's got to be to move away from that as we can. So I challenge you today, people of God, people of God, to move deeper and further in the kingdom of heaven. Because it would be my heart, as one of your pastors, to be able to look out here to this congregation and know that not a single one of you will ever be in hell. That's what I want. And I know you want that for your families and for the people that you love too. How do we do that? We do that by being ruthless about eradicating sin in our lives. Take it seriously. The king wants to be the king and he wants to rule over you and not allow the enemy to do it. Would you receive my prayer for you today? Oh Lord, these are your people. They are here seeking you. They are here to worship you. They love you. They want you. And some of us are bound tight by sin in our lives. Help us, Lord, to first ask forgiveness and then put things into our lives to help us free ourselves from the, the bounds, the binds, the cage, the traps that would keep us from the fulfilling life that you would have us to live. Help us to go deeper and further in to the kingdom of God. Thank you that you've made all this available to us, Lord Jesus, and we praise you and love you. Thank you for listening to our message today. I hope that you've been inspired to act upon what you've just heard and become a doer of the word. Feel free to contact us through the information on the screen or through our website. Better yet, if you're ever in the Niceville, Florida area, feel free to stop by and visit us at the Niceville United Methodist Church.